Hello and welcome to this review of my Epson Q703A. I bought this keyboard a while ago from eBay. It was OEM'd by Fujitsu and comes with a type of Fujitsu leaf spring switch that I haven't shown you yet, a pretty decent one actually, but it's also new old stock. And considering Fujitsu leaf spring is one of the smoothest linear switches ever made, one of my favorites actually, this can only be described as noise. Fujitsu made quite a few boards for Epson through the years, but all the Fujitsu boards are notoriously are difficult to convert, and indeed I don't have a converter for this. This is a shame, but hopefully I can get one at some point with some help. It uses a detachable cable with an 8-pin DIN connector on both ends, so even if you can convert it, you'll need to find a fitting socket for it, I guess. Although I've already shown Fujitsu leaf springs of the third generation before, which I abbreviate to FLS3, the switches in the Epson are of the considerably rarer second generation, which I haven't covered yet. FLS3 is a very nice, light and smooth linear switch with a broadly similar weighting to Cherry MX Red. They work using an ingenious system of a contact switch plate mounted flat on the PCB with a long leaf spring jutting out on top from which the switch derives its name. When Pressed down by the slider on top, this pushes two contact terminals underneath together, closing a circuit and signaling the switch is registered. One of the advantages that this arrangement brings compared to switches with the more conventional vertical contact arrangement, such as Cherry MX, Alps SKC, Space Invaders and countless others, is that it avoids parallel rubbing forces, leading to a contact-based switch with the smoothness of a contactless one. It's very clever and very effective, it's one of the smoothest switches I know. Another curious trait of this switch is that it's one of the very few designs that don't incorporate a coil spring at all, which is an excellent example why the presence of a coil spring is a terrible criterion by which to judge whether a switch is mechanical or not. See also my video on this subject about what constitutes a switch as mechanical. The rest of the switches consist of a detachable barrel, which holds the slider, which is made out of very thick plastic by the way, and these slider barrels can be clipped out individually from a shared mounting plate. So there was FLS3, the FLS2 design is broadly the same, except with a few more bells and whistles, and the details are slightly different. Like FLS3, there are sliders that are pre-installed in a detachable barrel clipped into a mounting plate, but each unit contains a rubber O-ring to dampen the switch sound. It also comes pre-lubricated, which I don't think is the case on FLS3. If it is, I've never seen it before on any of mine. The lubricant and perfect condition of this unit, which is important as FLS are not immune to dirt and especially heavy use after all, make an already smooth switch smooth to top tier levels. As I said, this is good enough that it can compete with some contactless switches and have named it among them several times in previous videos. Although admittedly they feel like they're somewhat short travel, I've measured the travel to be still a full 4mm using some digital calibers. It's never the most accurate means of measuring, but it's the only one I have at my disposal, unfortunately. I think the feeling of shortness just comes from the feel of the dampeners. They don't feel particularly mushy, really. It's very firm rubber, but I still prefer the harder landing of FLS3. I guess I could remove the dampeners, but because they're integrated into the switch rather than just held under the keycap, like with chair. MX, I don't think it would be all that easy. The sound dampening that they bring is impressive though. Here's a typing sound comparison between an FLS3 board and the Epson. Not bad, especially considering the Epson has a much roomier, and therefore louder, case. The larger keys, excluding the spacebar, have special landing pads on top of the mounting plate to reduce their sound even further. However, even though they're very thick and rise up quite far off of the top of the mounting plate, it doesn't appear that they contact the keycaps even if they're pressed all the way down. And speaking of the mounting plate, the build quality of the keyboard is excellent with a pretty damn thick steel mounting plate and thick plastic case. It weighs 1800 grams in units that do make sense, or in imperial units, 3.97 avoir du poids pounds, 4.82 troy pounds, 5.14 tower pounds, 4.12 mercantile pounds, 3.86 london pounds, 27,778 grains of barley, 37,038 grains of wheat, 39,507 tower grains, 36,000 pearl grains, 63.5 
five ounces, eleven hundred and fifty seven penny weights, a thousand and sixteen drachms, point two eight three stone, point one four two quarters, point zero three five hundred weights, point zero zero one nine eight short tons, point zero zero one seven seven long tons, and point one two three slugs. It's also rather large, 51 centimeters wide in useful units, or in imperial units, 20.08 inches, 1.67 feet, 0.558 yards, 0.025 chains, 0.0025 furlongs, 0.00032 miles, 0.00028 nautical miles, 0.00011 leagues, 0.279 fathoms, 2.54 links, 0.101 rods, 0.0028 cables, or 20,079 thou. Its depth is also very impressive, at 22.5 centimetres, or 8.86 inches, 0.738 feet, 0.246. The layout is pretty interesting. This one is a French model, as evidenced by the Azerty layout. I know, nothing in life is perfect, but it contains clear influences of Japanese keyboard layouts too, with a diamond-style nav and a 19-key numpad that includes a triple zero key. Apart from 10 F keys at the top here, it also has four SF keys, presumably for special functions. These keys also include integrated lock lines, lights. And speaking of integrated lock lights, it also has these lights for caps lock, and most notably, the insert key. This is great, because insert also causes a status effect, like caps and num lock, so I'd say it's pretty nice to have it like this, especially as I hate to have insert toggled on, because it makes all your letters disappear if you are not careful. These keys with integrated lock lights use a different type of slider to make room for the LED. Unlike those on their magnetic read switches, the LEDs don't travel with the keycap though. Having only 10 F keys might sound weird, but this was actually pretty standard before the IBM Model M came out in 1985. And this one is older than that, 36 years, or in Imperial units, 192,681,688 hamster wheel turns, so this would have been pretty standard. An interesting detail is the feet, they're not flip out, but turn out it seems. As indicated on the back, you can turn them in either direction. At first you might be wondering what's going on, because turning them like this doesn't actually extend them, but you're supposed to rotate them into a specific position, and then extend them and then lock them again, like this. There's three positions that you can select. This is the most extended. I think it's a bit weird and not as convenient as flip out feet, I think, but it's robust at least. Another nice feature is the keycaps. Fujitsu made some of the best keycaps in history, and these ones are their iconic and beautiful ABS double shots with spherical key tops. They were record holding 3mm thick, or 0.00328 yards, 0.118. This is exactly twice as thick as even Cherry's old and well loved double shots, which are 1.5mm. By now, you'll probably be able to work out what that is in furlongs. In any case, it's impressive. Interestingly, the French keycaps, for which they couldn't be bothered to make special moulds, I guess, are lasered, as you can see, the lettering is clearly recessed, but they're still double shots. I guess they're just engraved blanks. I've seen it on other keyboards before, but it's still funky. The F keys are even re-legendable, which are the first of this type I've seen. You can take off the tops and put a piece of paper or something in between to remind you of what function that key fulfills. Also, uncommonly for read legendables, it already has pre-printed legends on the inside, while most read legendable keys are blank by default. The colour scheme is also very nice. It's a two-tone light and dark grey-brown that looks very classy. You might have thought it was black at first, and the camera doesn't pick it up very well, but it's actually a tasty, very dark chocolate kind of colour. Contrast it with the black inner shot of this keycap. Nice! I think if this thing had a black case, it would look absolutely kick-ass. Anyway, overall, this is a very nice and interesting specimen. I think without dampeners and with a black case, and with a converter of course, this would be one hell of a keyboard. That's it for this review, thank you for watching, I hope you enjoyed it, and following is a typing demonstration of me typing on this keyboard.